Chapter 18 of Famous Men of the Middle Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Alec Datesman. Famous Men of the Middle Ages by John H. Haran and A. B. Poland. Chapter 18. The Cid. Late one sunny afternoon, one and twenty knights were riding along the highway in the northern part of Spain. As they were passing a deep mire, they heard cries for help, and, turning, saw a poor leper who was sinking in the mud. One of the knights, a handsome young man, was touched by the cries. He dismounted, rescued the poor fellow, took him upon his own horse, and thus the two rode to the inn. The other knights wondered at this. When they reached the inn where they were to stop for the night, they wondered still more, for their companion gave the leper a seat next to himself at the table. After supper, the knight shared his own bed with the leper. If the knight had not done this, the leper would have been driven out of the town, with nothing to eat and no place in which to sleep. At midnight, while the young man was fast asleep, the leper breathed upon his back. This awakened the knight, who turned quickly in his bed and found that the leper was gone. The knight called for a light and searched, but in vain. While he was wondering about what had happened, a man in shining garments appeared before him and said, Rodrigo, art thou asleep or awake? The knight answered, I am awake, but who art thou that bringest such brightness? The vision replied, I am Saint Lazarus, the leper to whom thou wast so kind. Because I have breathed upon thee, thou shalt accomplish whatever thou shalt undertake, in peace or in battle. All shall honor thee. Therefore, go on and evermore do good. With that the vision vanished. The promise of St. Lazarus was fulfilled. In time, young Rodrigo became the great hero of Spain. The Spaniards called him the Campeador, or Champion. The Saracens called him the Cid, or Lord. His real name was Rodrigo Diaz de Bivar, but he is usually spoken of as the Cid. The Goths, after the death of Alaric, had taken Spain away from the Romans. The Saracens, or, as they were usually called, the Moors, had crossed the sea from Africa, and in turn had taken Spain from the Goths. In the time of Charles Martel, the Goths had lost all Spain except the small mountain district in the northern part. In the time of the Cid, the Goths, now called Spaniards, had driven the Moors down to about the middle of Spain. War went on all the time between the two races, and many men spent their lives in fighting. The Spanish part of the country then comprised the kingdoms of Castile, Leon, Aragon, and others. The Cid was a subject of Fernando of Castile. Fernando had a dispute with the king of Aragon about a city which each claimed. They agreed to decide the matter by a combat. Each was to choose a champion. The champions were to fight, and the king whose champion won was to have the city. Fernando chose the Cid, and though the other champion was called the bravest knight in Spain, the youthful warrior vanquished him. When Alonso, a son of Fernando, succeeded to the throne, he became angry with the Cid with just cause, and banished him from Christian Spain. The Cid was in need of some money, so he filled two chests with sand and sent word to two wealthy moneylenders that he wished to borrow six hundred Spanish marks, about two thousand dollars, and would put into their hands his treasures of silver and gold, which were packed in two chests. But the moneylenders must solemnly swear not to open the chests until the full year had passed. To this they gladly agreed. They took the chests and loaned him six hundred marks. The Cid was now ready for his journey. Three hundred of his knights went into banishment with him. They crossed the mountains and entered the land of the Moors. Soon they reached the town of Alcocer, and after a siege, captured it and lived in it. Then the Moorish king of Valencia ordered two chiefs to take three thousand horsemen, recapture the town, and bring the Cid alive to him. So the Cid and his men were shut up in Alcocer and besieged. Famine threatened them, and they determined to cut their way through the army of the Moors. Suddenly and swiftly they poured from the gate of Alcocer, and a terrible battle was fought. The two Moorish chiefs were taken prisoners, and thirteen hundred of their men were killed in the battle. The Cid then became a vassal of the Moorish king of Saragossa. After a while Alfonso recalled the Cid from banishment and gave him seven castles and the lands adjoining them. He needed the Cid's help in the greatest of all his plans against the Moors. He was determined to capture Toledo. He attacked it with a large army in which there were soldiers from many foreign lands. The Cid is said to have been the commander. After a long siege the city fell, and the victorious army marched across the great bridge built by the Moors, which you would cross today if you went to Toledo. 
Valencia was one of the largest and richest cities in Moorish Spain. It was strongly fortified, but the Cid determined to attack it. The plain about the city was irrigated by streams that came down from the neighboring hills. To prevent the Cid's army from coming near the city, the Saracens flooded the plain, but the Cid camped on high ground above the plain and from that point besieged the city. Food became very scarce in Valencia. Wheat, barley, and cheese were all so dear that none but the rich could buy them. People ate horses, dogs, cats, and mice, until in the whole city only three horses and a mule were left alive. Then, on the 15th of June, 1094, the governor went to the camp of the Cid and delivered to him the keys of the city. The Cid placed his men in all of the forts and took the citadel as his own dwelling. His banner floated from the towers. He called himself the Prince of Valencia. When the King of Morocco heard of this, he raised an army of 50,000 men. They crossed from Africa to Spain and laid siege to Valencia. But the Cid with his men made a sudden sally and routed them and pursued them for miles. It is said that 15,000 soldiers were drowned in the river Guadalquivar, which they tried to cross. The Cid was at the height of his power and lived in great magnificence. One of the first things he did was to repay the two friends who had lent him the 600 marks. He was kind and just to the Saracens who had become his subjects. They were allowed to have their mosques and to worship God as they thought right. In time, the Cid's health began to fail. He could lead his men forth to battle no more. He sent an army against the Moors, but it was so completely routed that few of his men came back to tell the tale. It is said by a Moorish writer that, when the runaways reached him, the Cid died of rage. There is a legend that shortly before he died, he saw a vision of St. Peter, who told him that he should gain a victory over the Saracens after his death. So the Cid gave orders that his body should be embalmed. It was so well preserved that it seemed alive. It was clothed in a coat of mail, and the sword that had won so many battles was placed in the hand. Then it was mounted upon the Cid's favorite horse and fastened to the saddle, and at midnight was borne out of the gate of Valencia with a guard of a thousand knights. All silently they marched to a spot where the Moorish king, with thirty-six chieftains, lay encamped, and at daylight the knights of the Cid made a sudden attack. The king awoke. It seemed to him that there were coming against him full seventy thousand knights, all dressed in robes as white as snow, and before them rode a knight, taller than all the rest, holding in his left hand a snow-white banner, and in the other a sword which seemed a fire. So afraid were the Moorish chief and his men that they fled to the sea, and twenty thousand of them were drowned as they tried to reach their ships. There is a Latin inscription near the tomb of the Cid which may be translated, Brave and unconquered, famous in triumphs of war, enclosed in this tomb lies Roderick the Great of Bivar. End of chapter 18. Recorded by Alec Datesman, Brooklyn, New York. Chapter 19 of Famous Men of the Middle Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine. Chapter 19 Edward the Confessor. Edward the Confessor, King from 1042 till 1066. The Danish kings who followed Canute were not like him. They were cruel, unjust rulers, and all the people of England hated them. So when in the year 1042 the last of them died, Edward, the son of the Saxon Ethelred, was elected king. He is known in history as Edward the Confessor. He was a man of holy life and after his death was made a saint by the church with the title of the Confessor. Though born in England, he passed the greater part of his life in Normandy as an exile from his native land. He was thirty-eight years old when he returned from Normandy to become king. As he had lived so long in Normandy, he always seemed more like a Norman than one of English birth. He generally spoke the French language, and he chose Normans to fill many of the highest offices in his kingdom. For the first eight years of his reign, there was perfect peace in his kingdom, except in the counties of Kent and Excess, where pirates from the North Sea made occasional attacks. 
These pirates were mostly Norwegians, whose leader was a barbarian named Kerdrick. They would come sweeping down upon the Kentish coast in many ships, make a landing where there were no soldiers, and fall upon the towns and plunder them. Then, as swiftly and suddenly as they had come, they would sail away homeward before they could be captured. One day, Kerdrick's fleet arrived off the coast, and as no opposing force was visible, the pirates landed and started toward the nearest town to plunder it. By a quick march, a body of English soldiers reached the town before the pirates, and when the latter arrived, they found a strong force drawn up to give them battle. A short struggle took place. More than half of the pirates were slain, and the remainder were taken prisoners. After the prisoners had been secured, the English ships that were stationed on the coast attacked the pirate fleet and destroyed it. Edward took part in the events upon which Shakespeare, five hundred years later, founded his famous tragedy of Macbeth. There lived in Scotland during his reign an ambitious nobleman named Macbeth, who invited Duncan, the king of Scotland, to his castle and murdered him. He tried to make it appear that the murder had been committed by Duncan's attendants, and he caused the king's son and heir, Prince Malcolm, to flee from the land. He then made himself king of Scotland. Malcolm hastened to England and appealed to King Edward for help. When the king was told the number of soldiers Malcolm would probably need, he gave orders for double that number to march into Scotland. Malcolm with this support attacked Macbeth, and after several well-fought battles, drove the usurper from Scotland and took possession of the throne. Edward did a great deal during his reign to aid the cause of Christianity. He rebuilt the ancient Westminster Abbey in London and erected churches and monasteries in different parts of England. Edward was long supposed to have made many just laws, and years after his death the English people, when suffering from bad government, would exclaim, Oh, for the good laws and customs of Edward the Confessor! What he really did was to have the old laws faithfully carried out. He died in 1066 and was buried in Westminster Abbey. End of the chapter 19「Chapter Twenty of Famous Men of the Middle Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Moline. Famous Men of the Middle Ages by John H. Heron and A. B. Poland. Chapter Twenty. William the Conqueror. King from 1066 to 1087. On the death of Edward the Confessor, the throne of England was claimed by William, Duke of Normandy. When Edward took refuge in Normandy, after the Danes conquered England, he stayed at the palace of William. He was very kindly treated there, and William said that Edward had promised in gratitude that William should succeed him as King of England. One day, in the year 1066, when William was hunting with a party of his courtiers in the woods near Rouen, a noble came riding rapidly toward him, shouting, Your Highness, a messenger has just arrived from England, bearing the news that King Edward is dead, and that Harold, the son of Earl Godwin, has been placed on the English throne. William at once called his nobles together and said to them, I must have your consent that I enforce my claim to England's throne by arms. The barons gave their consent, so an army of 60,000 men was collected, and a large fleet of ships was built to carry this force across the channel. During the months of preparation, William sent an embassy to the English court to demand of Harold that he give up the throne. Harold refused. Soon, all England was startled by the news that William had landed on the English coast at the port of Hastings with a large force. 
Harold immediately marched as quickly as possible from the north to the southern coast. In a week or so he arrived at a place called Senlac, nine miles from Hastings, in the neighborhood of which town the Norman army was encamped. He took his position on a low range of hills and awaited the attack of William. His men were tired with their march, but he encouraged them and bade them prepare for battle. On the morning of October 14, 1066, the two armies met. The Norman foot soldiers opened the battle by charging on the English stockades. They ran over the plain to the low hills, singing a war song at the top of their voices. But they could not carry the stockades, although they tried again and again. They therefore attacked another part of the English forces. William, clad in complete armor, was in the very front of the fight, urging on his troops. At one time a cry arose in his army that he was slain, and a panic began. William drew off his helmet and rode along the line, shouting, I live! I live! Fight on! We shall conquer yet! The battle raged from morning till night. Harold himself fought on foot at the head of his army and behaved most valiantly. His men, tired as they were from their forced march, bravely struggled on, hour after hour. But at last William turned their lines and threw them into confusion. As the sun went down, Harold was killed and his men gave up the fight. From Hastings, William marched toward London. On the way, he received the surrender of some towns and burned others that would not surrender. London submitted and some of the nobles and citizens came forth and offered the English crown to the Norman duke. On the 25th of December, 1066, the Conqueror, as he is always called, was crowned in Westminster Abbey by Archbishop Yaldred. Both English and Norman people were present. When the question was asked by the Archbishop, Will you have William, Duke of Normandy, for your king? All present answered, We will. At first, William ruled England with moderation. The laws and customs were not changed, and in a few months after the Battle of Hastings, the kingdom was so peaceful that William left it in charge of his brother and went to Normandy for a visit. While he was gone, many of the English nobles rebelled against him, and on his return he made very severe laws and did some very harsh things. He laid waste an extensive territory, destroying all the houses upon it, and causing thousands of persons to die from lack of food and shelter, because the people there had not sworn allegiance to him. He made a law that all lights should be put out and fires covered with ashes at eight o'clock every evening, so that the people would have to go to bed then. A bell was rung in all cities and towns throughout England to warn the people of the hour. The bell was called the curfew, from the French words couvre-feu, meaning to cover fire. To find out about the lands of England and their owners, so that everybody might be made to pay taxes, he appointed officers in all the towns to report what estates there were, who owned them, and what they were worth. The reports were copied into two volumes, called the Doomsday Book. This book showed that England at that time had a population of a little more than a million. William made war on Scotland and conquered it. During a war with the King of France, the city of Mantes was burned by William's soldiers. As William rode over the ruins, his horse stumbled, and the king was thrown to the ground and injured. He was born to Rouen, where he lay ill for six weeks. His sons and even his attendants abandoned him in his last hours. It is said that in his death struggle he fell from his bed to the floor, where his body was found by his servants. End of chapter 20. Recording by Roger Moline.
Chapter Twenty One of Famous Men of the Middle Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine. Famous Men of the Middle Ages by John H. Hahn and A. B. Poland. Chapter Twenty One. Peter the Hermit. Peter the Hermit, about 1050 till 1115. During the Middle Ages, the Christians of Europe used to go to the Holy Land for the purpose of visiting the tomb of Christ and other sacred places. Those who made such a journey were called pilgrims. Every year thousands of pilgrims, kings, nobles, and people of humbler rank went to the Holy Land. While Jerusalem was in the hands of the Arabian caliphs who reigned at Baghdad, the Christian pilgrims were generally well treated. After about 1070, when the Turks took possession of the city, outrages became so frequent that it seemed as if it would not be safe for Christians to visit the Savior's tomb at all. About the year 1095, there lived at Amiens, France, a monk named Peter the Hermit. Peter was present at a council of clergy and people held at Clermont in France, when His Holiness Pope Urban II made a stirring speech. He begged the people to rescue the Holy Sepulchre and other sacred sites from the Mohammedans. The council was so roused by his words that they broke forth into loud cries, God wills it, God wills it. It is indeed his will, said the Pope and let these words be your war cry when you meet the enemy. Peter listened with deep attention. Immediately after the council he began to preach in favor of a war against the Turks. With head and feet bare and clothed in a long coarse robe tied at the waist with a rope, he went through Italy from city to city, riding on a donkey. He preached in churches, on the streets, wherever he could secure an audience. When Peter had gone over Italy, he crossed the Alps and preached to the people of France, Germany, and neighboring countries. Everywhere he kindled the zeal of the people, and multitudes enlisted as champions of the cross. Thus began the first of seven wars known as the Crusades, or Wars of the Cross, waged to rescue the Holy Land from the Mohammedans. It is said that more than a hundred thousand men, women, and children went on the first crusade. Each wore on the right shoulder the emblem of the cross. Peter was in command of one portion of this great multitude. His followers began their journey with shouts of joy and praise. But they had no proper supply of provisions. So, when passing through Hungary, they plundered the towns and compelled the inhabitants to support them. This roused the anger of the Hungarians. They attacked the crusaders and killed a great many of them. After long delays, about 7,000 of those who had started on the crusade reached Constantinople. They were still enthusiastic and sounded their war cry, God wills it, with as much fervor as when they first joined Peter's standard. Leaving Constantinople, they went eastward into the land of the Turks. A powerful army led by the Sultan met them. The crusaders fought heroically, all day long, but at length were badly beaten. Only a few escaped and found their way back to Constantinople. Peter the Hermit had left the crusaders before the battle and returned to Constantinople. He afterwards joined the army of Godfrey of Boulogne. Godfrey's army was composed of six divisions, each commanded by a soldier of high rank and distinction. It was a well-organized and disciplined force and numbered about half a million men. It started only a few weeks after the irregular multitude which followed Peter the Hermit, and was really the first crusading army, for Peter's undisciplined throng could hardly be called an army. After a long march, Godfrey reached Antioch and laid siege to it. It was believed that this Muslim stronghold could be taken in a short time, but the city resisted the attacks of the Christians for seven months. Then it surrendered. And now something happened that none of the crusaders had dreamed of. An army of 200,000 Persians arrived to help the Muslims. 
they laid siege to Antioch and shut up the crusaders within its walls for weeks. However, after a number of engagements in which there was great loss of life, the Turks and Persians were at last driven away. The way was now open to Jerusalem. But out of the half million crusaders who had marched from Europe, less than fifty thousand were left. They had won their way at a fearful cost. Still onward they pushed with brave hearts, until on a bright summer morning they caught the first glimpse of the holy city in the distance. For two whole years they had toiled and suffered in the hope of reaching Jerusalem. Now it lay before them. But it had yet to be taken. For more than five weeks the crusaders carried on the siege. Finally, on the 15th of July, 1099, the Turks surrendered. The Muslim flag was hauled down and the banner of the cross floated over the holy city. A few days after the Christians had occupied Jerusalem, Godfrey of Bouillon was chosen king of the Holy Land. I will accept the office, he said, but no crown must be put on my head, and I must never be called king. I cannot wear a crown of gold where Christ wore one of thorns, nor will I be called king in the land where once lived the king of kings. Peter the Hermit is said to have preached an eloquent sermon on the Mount of Olives. He did not, however, remain long in Jerusalem, but after the capture of the city returned to Europe. He founded a monastery in France, and within its walls passed the rest of his life. End of the chapter 21
and as a punishment for their conduct, each was condemned, with ten of his counts and barons, to carry dogs on his shoulders from one county to another. Frederick finally succeeded in keeping the nobles in the different provinces of Germany at peace with another, and persuaded them to work together for the good of the whole empire. He had no more trouble with them, and for many years his reign was peaceful and prosperous. After the Christians had held Jerusalem for eighty-eight years, it was recaptured by the Moslems under the lead of the famous Saladin in the year 1187. There was much excitement in Christendom, and the Pope proclaimed another crusade. Frederick immediately raised an army of crusaders in the German Empire, and with 150,000 men started for Palestine. He marched into Asia Minor, attacked the Muslim forces, and defeated them in two great battles. But before the brave old warrior reached the Holy Land, his career was suddenly brought to an end. One day his army was crossing a small bridge over a river in Asia Minor. At a moment when the bridge was crowded with troops, Frederick rode up rapidly. He was impatient to join his son, who was leading the advance guard, and when he found that he could not cross immediately by the bridge, he plunged into the river to swim his horse across. Both horse and rider were swept away by the current. Barbarossa's heavy armor made him helpless, and he was drowned. His body was recovered and buried in Antioch. Barbarossa was so much loved by his people that it was said, Germany and Frederick Barbarossa are one in the hearts of the Germans. His death caused the greatest grief among the German crusaders. They had now little heart to fight the infidels, and most of them at once returned to Germany. In the empire the dead hero was long mourned, and for many years the peasants believed that Frederick was not really dead, but was asleep in a cave in the mountains of Germany, with his gallant knights around him. He was supposed to be sitting in his chair of state, with a crown upon his head, his eyes half closed in slumber, his beard as white as snow, and so long that it reached the ground. When the ravens cease to fly around the mountain, said the legend, Barbarossa shall awake and restore Germany to its ancient greatness. End of chapter 22